everyone. We're going to get started again. And I would like to welcome Ryan Gerard, who's an SQA engineer from Symantec. And he's going to be talking about scalable test selection. All right. Am I on? All right. Thank you, Amanda. Um, you may have to put up with a little bit of sniffling today. I have a nice like virus cocktail of fun going on right now. So pardon me if, if it gets in the way of the talk. So, I'm a, uh, so as Amanda said, my name is Ryan Gerard. I'm a QA engineer with Symantec with the Security 2.0 team, which is a, a relatively new team that's working on some web security engines uh, and, and also in the online identity space. And I'm uh, here to talk to you today about a project that we've been working on in my team, um, an idea and a prototype that we created for, to do a little bit more uh, intelligent test selection. Um, first off, just some logistics. Feel free to ask questions, um, unless it's going to be followed by, I don't know, like a tomato to the face. But otherwise, save your, you can save your questions to the end. I'm sure there will be time. So today we'll be talking about uh, sort of the basic problem and um, a suggested solution. Uh, suggested meaning it, it's going to be a high level look at the solution um, with some details on how we implemented it internally or prototyped it. Uh, some ideas on implementation, uh, other ways on measuring effectiveness, and some lessons learned. Also, I, sh I should preface this with saying, uh, you know, there's been some great talks here um, so far today. Uh, most of them are relatively low level, uh, machine and operations and whatnot. This is going to be a little bit higher up the stack. So before we start, um, a little bit of background. I, I can't assume you all know what regression testing is or what regression bugs are. So a regression bug is essentially a feature that used to work that now no longer works. And you'll see this in mature products that maybe have 20, 30 features out there. And, uh, a new release comes out, maybe a couple of the features don't work as well as they used to. Uh, this is known as a regression bug. So hence, you do regression testing, which is essentially a nice cache of tests that you go out and verify that the old functionality still works correctly. The basic problem, though, is that regression tests only increase, especially on mature products. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen this, right? This product starts out. You'll have a few, a few tests. Maybe a new build comes out. You'll run a few automated manual tests. Eventually, though, this turns into something unmanageable, at least within a certain amount of time. Right? You can't test everything all the time. So this is essentially a problem that doesn't scale well. So when you run into this situation, how do you determine what you should be testing? And another facet of the problem, a lot of times regression testing is testing all components when in reality maybe only a few are changing. So this is essentially wasted time and effort testing things that may not need to be tested. Certainly there may be dependencies between components. So if component one changes, you don't want to just change component one if there's a dependency on component two. But uh, I think these dependencies are things that can be learned, at least in terms of test selection. Uh, lastly, so typically all tests are not automated. Um, that you know, may not be true in some projects, but I would say for the most part, that's the case. You will have some manual testing. So in time-constrained situations, reducing your manual test load becomes incredibly important. Uh, let me give you the situation that uh, is near and dear to my heart. Um, let's say you have a release that's going out Friday. No matter what happens, management is determined, Friday, this thing is going out. And Thursday night, a major change goes into effect. How do you decide what to test at that point in time? You have literally hours, maybe, to test. You can, and you literally you just do not have enough time to test everything. So how do you decide what to test? So what are you doing now, is what I ask you. I mean, I would say most likely testing as much as possible, right? Staying late. But even in that, even in, even in that situation, you can't test everything. And you're probably going to miss things. So hopefully there'll be a better way to test, to select tests that you should be running. So here's the basic high level overview of what, what we're trying to do. Given a set of source code changes, determine the set of tests that need to be run. Now, in order to implement this, what we've decided to do is do a little bit of data mining 
on some of the test artifacts that are all uh, interrelated in testing. Things like your defect management system, the bugs that are associated with test cases and source code, your requirements, uh, test case execution history, and uh, build information. And from this, hopefully you'll have some sort of tool that can adequately determine what tests need to be run. This is a very uh, non-scientific graph that is really just meant to visualize an idea. That being, uh, your risk of releasing a regression bug back into the field is going to be much lower if you can execute every test that you have, right? But that's not realistic. You can't execute everything all the time. So we believe that if you have a better method of test selection, you can reduce your risk of releasing regression defects back into the field. If you can select the regression tests that, you're, that are more likely to fail, then those failures won't be seen in the field. So the way that we've attacked this problem is to look at uh, three different ways to associate source code with test cases. Source code deltas, source code changes with test cases. Uh, the first two uh, requirements and defects are a little bit more straightforward. We can make associations between the source code changes and what defects or, and what test cases are affected by those source code changes by doing a little bit of data binding on those two re management tools, the requirements management and maybe the defect management tool. And then we do some more direct uh, data mining in, in doing some build correlation. So here's the basic overview of how one would associate source code and test cases uh, based on requirements. So first off, you imagine that requirements are going to be defined, probably by product managers or you know, lead engineers, something like that. You'll have source code that's checked in to fulfill those requirements, and then test cases checked in to fulfill those requirements as well, correct? So given that, you can assume that there's going to be some sort of relationship between those two uh, pieces of information so that later on when source codes checked in you can say oh well this source code based on this relationship we found most likely we should be executing these test cases right because these test cases are associated with the source code through these requirements. Very similar situation with defects. Uh, let's say in the given situation you have a new build out, QA starts testing and a test case fails. A defect will be created, and source code will be checked in. And from there again, you can say, well, if a test case fails, and then source code's checked in to fix that failure, you probably have a relationship there, where late, the next time this source code is checked in, you can say, well, last time this was checked in, these test cases failed. It's probably a good idea to run these test cases again. The uh, build correlation method um, starts on day one. So build one, day one, uh, and ho hopefully you'll have all this information saved in a database for mining when you're implementing this on build 200. You have source code changes that are checked in, and then test cases that are failed. You can make a set association from this and say, the set of source code changes that are checked in failed this set of test cases. You can continue this with successive builds, more test case, more source code check-ins, more test case failures, and more set associations. So here, source code one and three are associated with test case failures three and five. So now, later on, build n, you have source code that's checked in, right? Let's hope by now that we have enough historical data to make some sort of intelligent predictions. So source code one and three are checked in, well, based on our you know, two-build history, right, we can make some, some kind of intelligent selection. We can say, well, it looks like we should probably be running these four tests that have failed in the past. Source code one failed in both cases, uh, those four tests. Source code three failed those two cases in that one test. So hence, the set of test cases is, is, can be selected intelligently. So now, given that the build history is method is only going to be accumulating test cases over time, um, you probably want to put in some kind of prioritization methods. So what we've done, very 
simple prioritization is uh, just look at frequency. So over the build history, test case one has failed more times. It's probably a better test case to run in this situation. There are other prioritization techniques uh, that you could use weighting, um, recent failures, things like that. It, it's really up to your context, whatever it is uh, that works best for you. This is how we view method usefulness over time. Um, in the beginning, uh, the requirements, as you can see, so the three icons here on the side are supposed to be your guide for the methods. So the requirements method at the top there uh, is going to be useful early because that's all you're going to have. At the very beginning, you won't have defects. You won't have many builds. Um, and hence, that will be essentially the only one you can use at first. However, as you gain uh, more data with more builds, more defects, uh, we think the other two methods will surpass requirements significantly, um, especially the build correlation method. So implementation. Um, so this is, this is the basic metadata that we think you should probably pull in to make these set associations, to make these associations. And uh, I don't think you should change any of the tools you're already using, you should integrate them. So for instance, bring in your change control systems, your defect tracking systems, your requirements management systems, test case management, and build system. I have to say, it is not necessarily easy to integrate all these systems together, especially if you're using third-party software or something that's not developed in-house, maybe something that's hosted somewhere else. You may not have direct programmatic access to it, which makes this obviously a more difficult problem. Um, but if you do, uh, more, the more data you have to mine, the better test selections you can make. So some very basic uh, overview of how this would be implemented. So let's go over the requirements association implementation first. So keep in mind, we're looking for a relationship between source code checked in and test cases checked in for per, per requirement. So an easy way to do it is to parse your requirements. Again, assuming you have programmatic access to these, to these databases. Look for the change numbers. Look for the test cases that were hopefully commented or somehow put in there to be associated with these requirements. So assuming you, can, you have the change lists or commit numbers or whatever, what have you, for your source control system, you can grab the file list associated for that requirement and say, with some amount of certainty, these test cases, one and two, are associated with these two source files. Now, when you go back to actually use this information, let's say that data has a change. There's a source change on the parse.c file. You can look back into your tables and say, with some amount of certainty, well, these source files are associated with these test cases based on, based on the requirements we have checked in. Hence, those are probably good test cases to run. For the defect association implementation, um, so again, in this case, we're looking for test case and source code associations, relationships, based on the defects that have been checked in. Uh, a good way to do this is, again, parse your defects. So this is going to be very similar to your requirements. Look for the change numbers and look for the test cases that have failed. So assuming that it's you know, hopefully in the comments or in some field that's associated with your defect, you can get the file list for that specific change or set of changes and associate, well, this test case failed with these source code changes. So it's probably some relationship. The way this will actually be used in the tool is very similar. Again, source changes will be coming in, and it will go down into that association table and say, well, according to these, with these source changes, what test cases do I need to run? And based on the history of your defects, it'll, it can hopefully tell you which test cases it suggests you should run, test cases that have failed in the past that probably have a relationship with this source code. So for the build correlation method, 
the first thing that you probably want to do that we did is integrate with your build system so that it parses each check-in and records the changes that are being made in some table, some database that you have access to. So you can say with certainty, OK, with build X, we have three changes and you know, five different source code changes. The next thing you'll want to do is integrate with your test case management system uh, to get more metadata, definitely. So then you can say again with some certainty, on build X, we had these three test cases run, and two of them failed. So we can say with some certainty, these two test case failures are associated with the last set of source code changes. So how this would actually look in the tool itself is with some source code change that's checked in, you can go down and, and, and try to uh, look at the build history and say, well, based on all of these n number of builds, with this piece of source code, how many of them have test cases that have failed? How many times have test cases failed with this source code checked in? So it looks like with these two, we have, you know, let's say this, for instance, there's only two builds that have been found with test cases four, five, and six that have failed when this source has been checked in in the past. Those are probably good tests to run this time around as well. So a quick summary and comparison. So I'll, we'll look at the first two um, right now. So requirements are definitely useful early on. Um, however, there's a, a main problem with management and processes that have to be in place for this to be really useful. Meaning, let's say you have test cases that are checked in. They have to somehow reference these requirements, either in the test case or in the requirement, however you do it. That may not always be the case. Not everyone does this. And at the same time, the source code, when it's checked in, has to say somewhere, somehow, this references you know, requirement X, right? Well, that's not as easy as sending out an email and telling people to start doing it. It takes a little bit of time, change, beating people over the head, things like that. With uh, defects, again, it'll be, it's useful later on, once you have a nice set of defects that you can, uh, you can mine through. Um, but very similarly to requirements, process changes are necessary. You have to have the data in the defects, which test cases failed, which source code was checked in to fix this defect. Um, somehow it has to be referenced within your change control system. Um, I know a lot of times we do it when, uh, when, tests, when source code's checked in, it'll say within the comments, within the description, uh, fixing defect you know, one, two, three. And in that way, we can later go on and mine all this information. Um, the build correlation data method is, is much useful later on. Um, however, it's a little bit more work. Uh, a, little, a few more systems need to be integrated, and it's going to be returning more test cases to you. So it, it's, not it's a little bit more error prone. It's not necessarily going to be useful method if it's returning 1,000 test cases to you, and you have you know, an hour, which is why you'll want to have some prioritization in there to determine which test cases to run. But uh, it's still, at least, it does narrow down the field. So our methodology is to use all three methods. So if we can find associations using all three approaches, each one will return a different set of tests for us to run. And from there, we can then determine, make some, another set of, another prioritization, another weighting technique to determine, OK, of the three methods that return tests, which test should we be running? I also have to say in our methodology, this isn't a replacement for any of our current processes. This is in addition to. So in the past, let's say, when the situation comes up, when source code's checked in at the last minute, we have to determine which tests to run. Um, you know, maybe you'll, you'll depend on your lead engineers or managers, whoever is familiar, most familiar with this uh, product or feature to say, oh, here are the test cases I suggest we run based on my own history and knowledge. So that is. A great technique. It's a very useful technique. And it's good to complement that with a system such as this that also says, OK, well, also based on some historical data, maybe here's a few you missed. Here's a couple to look at as well. So in the end, for your resultant test selection tool, you want to answer the question, what tests 
should I run for this change? So given a change that comes in, you can use each method to get a different set of tests that it suggests. Right, so here we have three methods returning three sets of tests that it suggests. And now you have a nice set of test cases that uh, may or may not be useful, more useful than whatever you were doing previously, probably staying late, testing as much as possible. So we've done some very simple prioritization on this tool internally on our prototype. So the first uh, easiest, most obvious way is by frequency. Which tests have come up the most? What's failed most frequently? So we can see, you know, it looks like test seven in terms of frequency has come up the most. So that should probably be uh, a higher priority than ones below it. You can also assign some simple weights. So here we've assigned some simple weights to defects and requirements and build correlations. This can be based off trust or where you are in your project. For instance, if you're early in your project, you probably are going to trust requirements. The requirements test that a little bit more because you're not going to have a lot of defect data. You're not going to have a lot of build data. So hence, the test sets, the tests returned by that method are probably more useful. So you can weight those accordingly. Uh, it may also be possible that you just find, just in general, for whatever reason, the defect method returns, uh, is, is more consistent in returning useful tests, tests that fail, tests that show problems. And if that's the case, if you find that to be the case, then uh, for whatever reason that's true, you can uh, weight those accordingly. So I want to talk about effectiveness. How do you measure a tool, such as how do you measure effectiveness? What metric would you use? Well, the first thing, uh, we're going on the presumption that uh, we want to run a test that's likely to fail. That's what we're looking for. Um, this is a bit of like test philosophy, so it's debatable, certainly. Um, you know, a lot of people believe running 1,000 tests and having them all pass you know, makes you feel good, right? Things are working, hopefully, probably. Um, and that's definitely a good philosophy to have. And we're look, but we are looking for tests that are likely to fail, because it's not something that we want to re-release back into the field. So in order to, do, in order to track this, we want to, we're looking at some, using some classic sort of security lingo. I was thinking later on this, and I'm, I was thinking that's probably not security lingo, but in, uh, I, come, I have more of a security background, so that, that's a little bit more prominent for me. So. so given that we want to select tests that are likely to fail, what is the worst case situation that could happen? That a test case is not selected that would have failed had it been selected. So that's our false positive, meaning that it was rejected, but it should have been accepted. Now, I want, to, I want, to keep it, I want you to keep in mind that this is a false positive on the tool, not the test. If the test itself is a false positive, that's no matter to us. That's, that's the... Uh, Tester's problem, whoever, whoever implemented it in the first place. We're trying to measure effectiveness of the tool itself. So if your test case is selected and did fail, true positive. That's something that was accepted that should have been accepted. Um, and in the other two cases, the true negative and false negative, we're not so interested in because they pass. Uh, either would have passed or did pass in the test selection. It's not. Um, data that we are, since we're not looking for test cases that pass, that's not something we really want to track. So in this case, we want to track our false positive rate on this tool. So now in measuring effectiveness, there are uh, a few different methods that we use that we recommend. Uh, at first, certainly a training period, meaning you run all of your tests and compare you compare what happened, the result, to what your tool suggested. So if you run all of your tests, and test cases one, two, and three failed, and your tool just fails to return tests one, two, and three, that's bad. That's a false negative. Those are tests that should have been selected but weren't, for whatever reason. So you want to put it through a training period in order to track your false positive rate. Getting back to risk, you're going to have to find a level, a false positive rate that you're comfortable with. Um, 
I think we're going somewhere between 5 and 10% on our team. But whatever it is you're comfortable with, whatever you find to be uh, realistic, uh, I guess it's something you're going to have to determine. Uh, we found random sampling to be very useful um, with the results set. So the results set right now, the tests returned are going to be directly from whatever data mining method is, is, is implemented. However, usually supplementing that with a few extra tests randomly selected just to see, what, see what's happening, make sure that uh, keeping you on your toes really uh, is, is useful. In particular, we find that if you have a randomly sampled test that then fails and obviously wasn't selected originally by the test, at that point it's good to stop and do a full run again of all of your tests uh, to track your false positive rate, to sort of rerun it. And, and going in, you know, sort of following on top of that, you should do regular audits, uh, meaning every once in a while, you know, however, however frequently you need to, uh, run all of your tests, manual and automated, and track your current false positive rate. So this is, again, a nice uh, little made-up graph to help illustrate an idea, um, meaning we believe that the risk of releasing a regression bug back into the field is going to be much lower if you, have a, if you can achieve a low false positive rate. So it's just something to keep in mind if you're going to implement a tool like this. Question? So he asks, would it be useful to intentionally inject failures to see if the tests come up. Yes, absolutely. That'd be awesome. That's a good idea. No. Uh, where's my pen and paper, though? I'm going to write that down. Um, yes, I think that'd be actually that'd be a great method to determine effectiveness. Right. Right, right, yeah. Well, first off, so let me get to the first part of that. Um, uh, if, if you have no failures, that's pretty amazing. I give you two thumbs up. Um, in that, with that in mind, you can still mine, let's say, requirements, right? Requirements doesn't depend. The requirements method doesn't depend on test failures. It's going to look at strictly, here's a requirement. Here are the test cases associated with it. Here are the source code changes associated with it. So that isn't dependent upon test failures. Um, but yes, so moving forward, have we looked at source code? So say that again. How, have we looked at source code coverage? Is, you know, we have like six, seven thousand test points. And, yeah. You know, they're hopefully not wholesale. Yeah. And we don't have the requirement. Right. You know, uh, sure. So we start from scratch, right? Right. So today I would say, assuming I'm 100% fine, I don't have the requirement. So I can see where the process starting today will help. But today, if I ask my system what test will fail if I send that file, it'll say, I have no idea. Right. It does, you know, the only correct is failure. My question is, if you use ghost coverage tool, now I can associate a file at least with the, you know, with the test. Right? Ah, OK. So one that passed. Right. So, so he's suggesting that uh, using a code coverage tool, you can associate source code with tests. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, no, we're not doing that at the moment. Again, pen and paper. Uh, was there another question over here? Right. Yeah, so exactly. So uh, it's suggested that uh, if you have a, a basic block that changes, you want to run the test cases associated with those basic blocks that change. Right, exactly. And that's, that's, what, that's what we're trying to achieve. So just um, a suggested use in the beginning. So assuming that this is, is your basic sort of build test system, a build system that then leads into some automated or manual or both kind of testing. Uh, and then hopefully that information saved in some sort of test management system. Uh, we suggest first just integrating it directly into your build system uh, and seeing what task cases come out. This is, this is going to be for your initial training period. And you'll probably want to do this for, for a fair amount of time before you feel comfortable with, with using these tests normally. 
uh, for the build. So sort of complementing your current system with this, with this extra system, you know, basically I'm suggesting you add more work on top of your current work. Um, so getting to some lessons learned. So the prototype that we built is still relatively new, uh, relatively young. We've implemented two of the three systems of the three methods, the defect and the build correlation method. And uh, we don't have the scale of tests yet that uh, this will be very useful for. We're in the scale of hundreds now. We're anticipating a scale of thousands so that hopefully when we get to that point in time, a year or two from now, and we have thousands of tests to run, when we get to that situation when we you know, have an hour to test before you know, some sort of critical security bug needs to be fixed immediately, um, we'll have this in place so that we can go out and, s and see what the suggested tests are that we need to run through our thousands of tests. Uh, process changes um, are, can be difficult. It kind of depends on your environment and atmosphere and your company. Um, if the processes are already in place, that's awesome. If they're not, it's always a little bit harder to, uh, to get those in place and to enforce them. And meaning these process changes being in particular, let's say with new defects, you have to say in the defect which test case failed. And when source code's checked in that, fix that fixes that defect, it has to say, I'm fixing this defect. If that information isn't present somewhere, it's gonna be hard to detect. Um, and again, with the same thing with requirements. When source code's checked in that fulfills requirements, it has to say somewhere, oh, I'm fulfilling requirement X, so that later on we can say, aha, now a relationship can be made. Random sampling is useful. Uh, ah, setting a self false positive goal is um, useful. Otherwise, it's, it's sort of like trying to achieve that, that nth degree of quality, it's impossible. You have to, at some point, find what you're comfortable with and say, well, we're at 6% false positive rate. It's not perfect, but uh, good enough. Uh, random sampling, I think, um, is very useful, keeps you on your toes. And uh, integrating these systems can be very difficult. Um, if you, you may not have access to all the data you need, I would say work with whatever data you can get access to. Um, you know, sort of schmooze the teams you need to get access to these databases, if possible, and uh, mine the data for your own usefulness. So to conclude, um, in those time-constrained situations, that last-minute change uh, on Thursday night and you have to release Friday, whether, whether you know, for the desktop or the web, even if it's just like an internal milestone, you can't literally test everything. It's impossible. Uh, e even if it's not time constrained, maybe it's resource constraint or system constraint. Um, if your build test system takes 12 hours but you only have six, that probably means your test system uh, is gonna have less time. So given that, you need to, uh, we've suggested methods to help reduce your risk in these crunch time periods. And not only reduce your risk, but help save some of those human cycles. I mean, in the end, Hopefully the, the automated tests that you have aren't taking as long as the manual tests. The manual tests are gonna be much more expensive. Your human time is much more expensive than your computing time. And so what we're hoping is that you can save your human time for more important problems, like catching butterflies, for instance. Uh, with that, I conclude my formal presentation and I am here to take any questions that you have. No, so the question was, uh, he, I suggested 12 hour build times, but we only have six hours to release. Is those the time periods I was working with? Um, no, those are time periods I've heard about though from other companies. I have people come and tell me that, oh, our build test cycle takes like 16 hours or a day or eight hours. And it's, um, ours isn't there yet. Ours is uh, probably about two and a half hours, but it's still a younger project. So it's only gonna go up. Those things generally don't decrease. Right. But you know, not that we don't break them on our own, we do. But sometimes it's just you know the, the network is you and suddenly you know half of your tests go over. Right. Or okay. You can just have a VM version and we can not under source control and a bunch of things suddenly break. How do you avoid that polluting your database in such a way that now you know right. that could be the wrong thing or you know, whatever? 
so, so the question is, how do we help, uh, how, how do we work with um, environmental problems, things outside of your control, um, or outside the control of the test? Let's say someone installed a new uh, GCC package that now is breaking all of your tests. Um, well, I guess in essence, I'll say that we don't. And I don't think this tool is trying to solve that problem. It has to assume at some level that the tests are correct, right? That the tests were written correctly, and if and that includes environmental problems. Well, uh, if I send one file, right, and suddenly all my tests break okay. because of environment, I don't want to. I mean, I want to do ah, it, I do the right. Okay, yeah, no, that's true. Okay, so he he, he said uh, we probably want to undo the association if it's breaking for uh, a reason that's that's not normal, that's not a part of the test. Yeah, that's true. So I guess you, that's that's another thing in in terms of let's say a web management console or something like that, that that can help with these associations, there has to be a way to go and backtrack and say, oh, this association is actually false. This is a bad association to make. I mean, hopefully, if you have enough data over a long period of time, you'll be able to filter that out, um, or at least prioritize it lower and say, you know, well, it's, you know, these test cases have failed a lot more than the one random one that is, that's failed. Um, hopefully, those are run before the other one. Question. It seems, it seems like this tool would be really useful uh, for being integrated into uh, the entire testing process, just for prioritizing what tests to run first, even if you're running the entire suite. Uh, in similar usage, do you use it um, when you have sort of that crunch period that you're talking about, or is it something that your developers use as part of their continual testing cycle? So the question was, uh, this will be useful in the B to suggest some first set of tests to run. So is it run, so hold on, let me get this right. Is it run? Uh, in the only by us or in the full testing cycle? Right, it's like when you when you are like we're going to run the entire battery of tests. Right. Do you prioritize those tests with this tool? Ah, um, right now we're still you know we maintain a nice level of skepticism with this tool. So we look at the suggested tests and you know sort of compare them to what we're going to test and perhaps integrate them with our current tests. But it's certainly not a replacement, and uh, it, it's 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 in addition to of what we're currently doing. Yeah, but we do use it, I mean, at the very beginning, yeah. We see what it suggests, and then we run what we want, and then we also look at what it suggests. Right. So um, the question was, what tools are we using to plug into these uh, the requirements management and defect management tools? Well. Uh, well, so that's actually, we use an internal tool that was built internally. So because of that, we have full access to it, to the database, to all the data. So what the source code that we deal with, we mm -hmm. have the, the form of dependency chain. So okay. one source code here that depends on several others. Right. Do you take that into consideration when you select the test case that you should be able to cure? Um, I think we're hoping that those dependencies will uh, be learned in in sort of a, in an underlying manner, right? If if these if this source code if this source code change has a dependency on another source code change, but they both break the same test, hopefully that that can be mined out. Um, we aren't doing anything specifically for that situation, though. Also, I, I want to mention um, something I, for, I forgot to mention. This idea of selecting better tests to run in crunch periods is, is definitely becoming more and more important in this you know, sort of moving software as a service world where release times are getting shorter and shorter. Um, I went to a talk once by Katarina Fake, who's the, one of the Flickr people, and she mentioned that at one point they're releasing, they're, test, they're, they're building, testing, and releasing every half an hour. Now, uh, that was pretty amazing. I didn't want to stand up and call shenanigans on her in the middle of the talk, but it seems pretty like, Amazing, if if you know if if that's uh, valid. All right, if there aren't any more questions, uh, I'll be out in the hall and available. If you have any more questions for me, thank you for coming.